It's been nearly 50 years since the last human set foot on the moon. Now we're going back, and possibly beyond. Plans call for the first woman and the first person of color to land on the lunar surface this decade. NASA also wants to build a permanent space station in orbit around the moon that could serve as a pit stop for astronauts on the way to Mars. The station is called Gateway. I'm really excited to welcome Dan Hartman and Lara Kearney. Uh, they are the project, project manager and deputy project manager of NASA's Lunar Gateway. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be with you, Becky. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, it's really amazing and exciting um, to be thinking of going back to the moon. And I think that a lot of our viewers may be vaguely uh, aware that the Artemis mission is happening, that it is a return of humans um, back to the lunar surface. But Dan, I wanted to start uh, with you, if you could um, describe what kind of role the Lunar Gateway has within Artemis and, and what specifically it is. 2024, 2025 time, time period is when we plan to deploy uh, the first initial components of the Gateway. Uh, Orion spacecraft off the SLS rocket will come pay a visit. We'll aggregate there with the human lander system. Uh, we'll have logistics supplies come in there initially. And then that allows us to go back to and from the moon surface uh, and come back up to the gateway. And, and again, uh, bring science samples back up from the moon onto gateway, loaded back onto the Orion spacecraft, and then the crew can come home. One cool thing about the gateway is we have a kind of a solar electric propulsion capability, which is new, uh, especially at the, at the levels that we're talking about uh, being built by Maxar uh, and managed out of our Glenn Research Center. And it allows us to move the gateway to different orientations or different attitudes around the moon. So our ability to land at different locations on the moon is significantly increased from what we had in the Apollo days. So I, I would love to ask you, Laura, you know, this is such a different architecture from what we've obviously seen with the Apollo missions, where it's, you know, go and come back. This is much more uh, permanent. How did this idea kind of come together? How long has NASA been thinking about doing something a little bit more permanent um, in terms of the Lunar Gateway? I, you know, I think NASA as an agency has been thinking about this more permanent presence in a gateway type of architecture for many years, actually, kind of at a lower level study form. So I would say five, six years or more. Um, it wasn't until about two years ago when um, the agency actually said, OK, we would like to stand up a program that is called the Gateway Program and actually start to get moving. That's really exciting. And um so is the timeline currently for landings for the Artemis mission, like the first human landing to be somewhere in the 2024, like 2028 period? Yeah, we're looking in that kind of mid 20 period. The agency right now is looking at um, options for the landing system. And um, we should be able to make announcement in the next couple of months of when that landing date actually would be based on uh, the selections on the landers. It's um, our closest planetary body, but still, I mean, completely alien. Uh, I, I would just love to hear a little bit about the main challenges here. I know it's a, a, an enormous thing to be um, trying to put humans back on the moon again. Uh, what are some of the big challenges in getting that rolling? Yeah, we've done, again, as you mentioned, we've, we've done this before and the physics hasn't changed. So those <laughs> challenges are still there. The real difference this time, as Dan mentioned, is to go long-term and go sustainably. So those are really where the challenges are. How do you go and keep a crew there for 30 days, 60 days or longer? So just, you know, radiation environments for long-term, life support systems for long-term. Um, the crews need to be a little bit more autonomous for long-term. Um, and then of course for us, for our gateway, uh, the gateway will have no crew on it for 11 out of 12 months out of the year. So we have a challenge on how does that uh, spacecraft stay so far away from us for 11 months yet still be operable and healthy and still doing science research without even a crew being on board. So um, a lot of the challenges just come in just being there a lot longer than we were in the Apollo era. One of the things that I find really special about the plans here is that one of the of the first astronauts that will be planned to 
um, walk on the lunar surface again, uh, at least one will be a woman. And, you know, obviously the Apollo astronauts are all really inspirational, but it's been fun to see things like hidden figures come out in recent years and see all these contributions of yeah, women. Computer at NASA. They let women handle that sort of... Yes, it's an uphill battle. Yes, they let women do some things at NASA, Mr. Johnson. I'd love to know uh, just why that was an important decision for NASA and is there any um, woman astronaut in particular that is uh, known right now that you guys are thinking about having be the first woman on the moon and I'd love it if, if Laura could take this one. It's been a few months ago now named the Artemis team which is a group of astronauts that are kind of assigned to the Artemis program. They're following along with the vehicles. They're providing, you know, feedback. Um, they, we, they have not yet chosen the initial crews. Typically, we'll do that about two years out from a mission uh, when they need to start their training. So it'll still be a little while before they choose the specific crew. Um, but we do know that it's very likely that the first woman that walks on the moon is part of the Artemis team that was uh, announced several months ago. That's really exciting. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to that moment and uh, I think it will be very meaningful. Um, you know, mentioning all of these, and sorry, if Dan, if you wanted to add anything, uh, feel free. Well, just, uh, just a little bit because, you know, we, you know, we kind of had our first uh, uh, dual female EVA on board the International Space Station, right? Mm -hmm. Which was, a, which is just symbolic. It, 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 quite honestly, Laura and I would just kind of, it. The leadership of, of women in, in our workplace is just natural. I think it's it's just it's just commonplace. We don't we just select the best, and there's a there's there's plenty of of women that uh, that meet that criteria. So it's great. The other thing is, you know, the the EVA suits that we're building, right? We are taking into account this the the, you know, the I'll say the sizing in in the new suit that we're building for for being able to walk on the moon. We have that in development right now. Uh, we, we plan to, to test that out on the International Space Station uh, before we actually put it on a lander system and go, go down to the surface of the moon. There's a lot of lessons learned associated with, with that new suit uh, as far as dexterity, mobility. And so I think, uh, I think when, when you see the first uh, male and female walking around on the surface of the moon, you, you won't see them doing the bunny hops like they had to do on the Apollo. This is, uh, they're going to be, you know, I'm not going to say they'll be moonwalking or breakdancing, but, uh, <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of flexibility that you're going to see in these new suits and, and we can't, quite honestly, we can't wait to see it. Talking uh, about all of the challenges that, um, that will be faced in, in trying to move humans a little further out. This is also kind of seen as like a stepping stone towards eventually Mars missions, right? So what can we learn from um, the Lunar Gateway and from Artemis that might uh, help us to prepare for the ultimate kind of interplanetary step, which is really quite a giant leap. We also provide a really great test bed for the technologies that we're gonna need to go farther um, onto Mars. So we can envision a long-term gateway where we would have a potential transport habitat attached to gateway, where you learn how to live and work for long periods of time around the moon where you're relatively closer to home before you take that three year trip on to Mars. So um, I think it will be an opportunity to test out a lot again of the life support systems that have to really become regenerative and self-contained um, for a Mars mission. And I, I think you'll see us testing those systems out on the gateway around the moon before we take on that really, really challenging Mars mission. They're doing a great job again on the International Space Station closing that world where there are over 90% of all water is being reused or repurposed, right, for generating oxygen or drinking water. So, and then obviously, you know, urine turned into the drinking water. So it's it's great. We'll see that play out a little bit on, on Gateway as well. Uh, and I think what we'll also we'll see is a participation with the international partners, right? It's It's not cheap to go build these spacecraft uh, that it's for what it's going to go take to to do a Mars mission, right? So we're, we're going to, you know, embellish upon the the international partners, partnerships that we have in play right now. Uh, Laura mentioned this TransHab. We think that'll be, uh, you know, a, a bigger size module. I think psychological support, right? We have to get comfortable with that with crew members. It's such such a long distances away from from the Earth. And so 
in, in the radiation environment is the other, I think, going to be, a, I think we're going to find surprises and we're going to have to learn from those surprises as we try to, to live and operate not only our systems, but also, the, like I said, on the human body. So there's, there's a lot to be learned uh, as we go further. Yeah, as a, I'm a very risk averse person. So to hear that there will be lots of testing before we're trying to make that leap, it's very nice for me to hear. Uh, you know, but on that note, um, what will life actually be like on board the Gateway? Uh, how, how similar is the modular design to um, the ISS? And, uh, you know, how many people will be able to be up there at the same time? So right off the bat, Gateway is going to be significantly smaller than the International Space Station. So um, it, I, we kind of liken it to going on a camping trip, you know, in a tent versus being in an RV, right? So being on the Gateway early is a relatively small module. We'll never be the size of the International Space Station, so it'll be a little bit more confined. Um, but of course, we are talking about things like crew quarters and galleys and, uh, you know, a lot of lessons learned over time about what it takes, like Dan said, to keep a, a crew psychologically healthy. Things that are important to them, like personal space and, and gathering space and those kinds of things. So we're considering all of that in um, the Gateway. They have room to exercise, right, to keep them healthy over time. So a lot of those just basic things that go into keeping the crew healthy not only physically but psychologically as well um but again a little bit think more like a, like a, a camping trip right than <laughs> a, a five-star hotel <laughs> so wow. becky you had asked about crew size like you know our initial plans are four crew okay. uh, so orion can carry four so we would we would have four crew show up at orion or at gateway on orion uh, initially, the idea is that two of those crew would stay on board Gateway while two of them go down in the lander to do the, the surface mission. So so that's what we are currently sizing our systems for is um, that four, four crew members. We think with one logistics mission that we're, that we're you know, have procure, uh, we're procuring, we can support four crew on the Gateway for about 60 days. So, you know, two months, pretty good time for one spacecraft with the food, the water, the oxygen. If we elected to go fly additional logistics vehicles, in fact, the Japanese are talking about, you know, pr you know, providing the HTVX is what they use to supply the International Space Station today. That'll be another cargo vehicle that'll be going to and from, uh, you know, the lunar vicinity. The more logistics vehicles we can put together back to back, the longer the duration that the crew can stay. Obviously, Orion is built to well over 200 days of duration, and so we think we we can really push uh, the amount of research uh, and crew activity on the gateway, and it's really dependent on our, I'll say, our logistics supply chain chain. It's it's such a complicated infrastructure, and really interesting to compare as we've kind of touched on with Apollo. Um, you know, I love looking at the Apollo guidance computer and thinking about the comparison with a smartphone today. Uh, you know, what what are some of the ways that you have the sort of beneficiary of all this technology to do so so much more than what could be possible in the Apollo era. How, how are you most excited about building on a moon mission this time around? It's, it's communication, right? To and from the spacecraft. Uh, our data rates uh, on board that we can that run around. Uh, we basically have a gigabit Ethernet system that we're going to run around on the on the on the Gateway program, which is significantly higher than any other spacecraft we've flown. Uh, but more so, we have a lot of antenna systems that are at the Gateway that are directional toward the lunar surface, as well as antenna systems directed toward Earth. And so, I imagine when we see the first female and male walking on the surface of the moon, you will see a very, very high quality definition television signal. And so it won't be, it won't be the grainy, uh, which was spectacular in its own, you know, in back in the you know, late sixties, but it'll be, it'll be, I think we'll see a spectacular view uh, as these crew members are, are walking around on the moon. My last question, you know, um, given how big of a step this is, do you think there will ever be a permanent uh, human colony on the moon or is that something that we would even want? 
it definitely makes a lot of sense to go to the moon before you go to Mars, right? There's a lot of stuff we need to learn before we put these crews so far away from home for so long. The question is how long must you stay at the moon before you feel comfortable that you want to go on to Mars, you know? So I think that's where this permanent base on the moon comes from is it's that balancing is how long is long enough before you're comfortable for a Mars kind of mission. So, and different people have different opinions about that. Um, and then of course it all is about budget and where you want to put your investment because if, if you're sustaining a long-term permanent base on the moon, that money is not going into going to Mars. So it's just a kind of a trade space and a balancing act of, of how long you really feel like you want to stay on the moon before you're ready to take that next great leap to Mars.